Good morning, everybody. And thank you for joining me today. I'm Margaret Anderson from the Old Treasury Building. And I'm speaking today about some of the history of women's work in Victoria. This is part of a series of lectures given to accompany the exhibition, Lost Jobs, The Changing World of Work, which is on display in our building until December this year. Let me begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you today from the unceded land of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. I thank them for their care of culture and of country and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Now the title that you can see on your screen comes from an old proverb. It comes in at least two versions, perhaps more, but the most common is this one. Man works to a set of sun, but woman's work is never done. It reflects the fact that for most of recorded history, women have been responsible for the care of homes, families, and all the work that entailed. Even now, housework is never truly done, as anyone with children knows only too well. But in the past, it often involved hours and hours of hard labor with little rest at the end of the day, only to start all over again on the next. Throughout the 19th century and well into the 20th, marriage and the care of a family was assumed to be the only real work for women. By the middle years of the century, this assumption was supported by an elaborate set of ideals and conventions that positioned women as the angel in the house. This assumed that women were responsible not only for the physical work of the home, but had the care of its moral character as well. Carolyn Chisholm was not alone in calling wives and little children God's police. And it also helps to explain the many schemes established to try to bring single women to Victoria during the gold rush, when men outnumbered women to what was thought to be a dangerous degree. It wasn't only about finding domestic servants, it was also about finding wives. 19th century families were large and larger in Australia than in Britain. The Mudford family shown here in Kyneton in the 1890s had nine children, two of them twin girls. And that was quite common. The average family until the 1880s had between seven and eight children which means of course that many had more than that. Just looking at this picture, we know that Mrs. Mudford gave birth at least eight times, but it could well have been more. Stillbirths and deaths in infancy were common enough for most families to expect to lose at least one child before adulthood, if not more, and stillbirths were often not registered. Childbirth at this time was both painful and dangerous. There was little in the way of pain relief, although ether was theoretically available in hospitals later in the century. But most people took the Bible's injunction seriously, that childbirth was literally a reflection of Eve's punishment to be endured with pain and suffering. Despite better understanding of antisepsis amongst other things, the maternal death rate didn't drop noticeably until the 1920s, although infant mortality improved earlier. Contraception was not unknown before the late 19th century, but it was not very effective either. So given all that, why did women want to marry? It was largely a matter of convention and partly a matter of status. A married woman had a standing in society that a single woman lacked. Older single women were almost universally looked down on and disparaged. Spinsters had no clear place in society. As the saying went, they were left on the shelf, unwanted goods. Sometimes they were doomed to the care of parents or brothers or to assisting their various married sisters but their position was always an ambiguous one. But there was a grim practical reality too, because even if she wanted to support herself, it was almost impossible for a working woman to earn enough to do so. 
women were excluded from most occupations and the wages paid in those jobs that were open to woman, women were set by convention and later officially at about half the rate of the minimum wage paid to men. And this was quite deliberate. Even independent women like Carolyn Chisholm supported lower wages for women. In 1845, she wrote this. The rate payable for female labor should be proportional on a lower scale than that paid to men. High wages tempt many girls to keep single while it encourages indolent and lazy men to depend more and more upon their wives industry, thus partly reversing the design of nature. Lawmakers were well aware of the implications too. In the 20th century, when women began to demand better wages in earnest, conservatives pointed out plaintively that if women could support themselves by their work, they'd have no need to marry. And then there would men be. But the result, of course, was that women really had little choice but to marry. Those whose husbands died or deserted them, leaving them with small children to support, were plunged into immediate destitution. Most had no choice but to find another husband as soon as they could, because there was very little in the way of other assistance for them. The phrase, as cold as charity, was apt. But what this boiled down to was that the home was the primary workplace of most married women until at least the 1970s. Marilyn Lake suggests that the term housewife first appeared in the Herald in the 1860s, but it became a universal description for woman's primary occupation almost immediately. For the period up to and including the Second World War, most housework involved hard physical labor. The home was probably the last workplace to see any significant impact from technology. And it's largely true that most housework changed very little from the 1840s to the 1940s. Floors were swept, then washed and polished on hands and knees using a scrubbing brush. Furniture was dusted, lamps cleaned and trimmed, fireplaces swept out daily. Meals were cooked for most of the 19th century on wood stoves. Now just making meals for families of this size was no mean task. Quite apart from the food preparation, there was the management of the stove and this all had to be learned. The first cooking was fairly makeshift and on the gold fields mostly done outside over an open fire. In the towns, cooking on wood or coal-fired stoves was common until the late 19th century, and well after that in poorer districts. The first stoves were open ranges with pots suspended over open fires, sometimes with small closed ovens at the side. These stoves made kitchens hot and smoky and fire was an ever-present danger. The closed range was a great improvement and it gradually replaced the open range from the mid 19th century. A far greater variety of cooking was possible on the closed range, but still many households couldn't bake their own bread or manage the weekly roast. This was commonly taken to a nearby baker to cook for a small fee. Cooking on a wood-fired stove required skill and planning. The first job of the day was usually rekindling the kitchen fire, which was commonly banked up overnight. Nothing could be done until the fire heated the stove tops, which took some time. A large kettle of water was usually then left simmering on the stove, ready for tea, cooking water or washing water. But even making a cup of tea required forethought. I don't know if you've ever tried to heat a kettle of cold water on a wood-fired stove top from scratch. But if you have, you'll know that it takes a long time to come to the boil. When it arrived, the electric jug or kettle must have seemed miraculous. The temperature of early ovens was not regulated either, except by adding fuel or allowing the oven to cool. Nor was there a temperature gauge, which meant that early cooks had to learn to judge the heat of an oven by putting their hand inside and feeling. <laughs> 
Dishes requiring the hottest oven, like bread or scones, was then cooked first, with other dishes replacing them as the oven cooled down. Slow cooked dishes like milk puddings were generally cooked last. Skill and judgment were acquired over time and girls often learned to cook from their mothers, beginning with simple dishes when they were quite young. Domestic skills were also taught at school, especially as girls began to stay there longer. It was assumed that even girls who continued their education at a secondary school, and that was a tiny minority until the 1920s, but they would still take charge of a household eventually and should understand the basics of what was beginning to be called scientific household management. Girls learned cookery and other household skills, while boys were taught woodwork and sometimes metalwork. And this form of gendered curriculum remained in place until the late 20th century. Stoves also had to be kept scrupulously clean, not least because until the advent of electric irons, irons were all heated on the top of the stove. Not surprisingly, the invention of gas stoves was welcomed immediately. They were far cleaner and the heat was instant. So not surprisingly, gas stoves spread quickly into middle house households during the 1870s and 1880s. Electric stoves followed from the 1920s, but they took much longer to catch on. But not everyone could afford to buy a gas stove or to pay for the gas. And many working class households were still cooking with wood during the Second World War. However, it was probably laundry that was the worst job of all, since it was hot, heavy work that often took all of a day. Housewives or their servants often rose at five in the morning on wash days because, of course, they had to heat all the water before they could even begin. Then the heavy linens and other colour fast items were boiled, usually in a copper, and you can see the copper at the, uh, the, the bottom right of this slide where the tap is. Before they were wrung out and put through several changes of rinsing water. The final rinse often contained a bluing agent to make the whites look whiter. Laundries were often set up with a copper and two or three rinsing troughs side by side as shown here. My own mother was still using this setup in the early 1950s. She didn't get her first washing machine until the mid 50s, by which time she had two children. And even then she still had to put the clothes manually through the rinsing troughs using the ringer at the top of the washing machine. The automatic washing machine of the late 1950s was very much top of the range at the time. Most women, including my mother, had one of the models illustrated below it. Items that couldn't be boiled were often washed in a wash tub, sometimes using a washing board to help rub off the dirt. And as you can see from this slide, there was a huge gap between what was available to the rich and to the poor. Starching was another step in the process and many more things were starched in the past. They included small items like men's collars, large items like tablecloths and many things in between, including women's petticoats shown here, sometimes children's pinafores. There was skill involved in starching to get the right amount of stiffness without any lumps. And I suspect that very few women looked like this while they did it. Starched items then had to be dried and damped down again before ironing. Ironing, of course, was another time consuming chore. It often took all of another day. And in the summer, it must have been exhausting because the irons, as I said, had to be heated on the top of the stove. That meant ironing while standing next to the stove so that irons could be exchanged while they cooled. Most households had sets of flat irons in different sizes like these ones. And the irons were also extremely heavy because they worked both through heat and through weight pressure. 19th century housewives had strong arm muscles. These sorts of irons, known as flat irons, 
were still in use and on sale after the Second World War. Though electric irons were made from the early 20th century, few households were equipped with the power points to use them until much later. And in fact, some early irons like this one were made with long cords and were designed to plug into the light sockets. Because most people had electric light long before they had other forms of electric power. So it's not surprising, given the hard, dirty work involved on a daily basis, that any woman who could afford to do so hired domestic servants to do the work for her. Domestic service was the most common female occupation in Victoria from the 1830s until 1900, although not surprisingly, the numbers declined quite quickly after that, as other employment options arose. And there were never enough domestic servants to meet the demand anyway. At various times, attempts were made to lure women to the colony to work as domestic servants, but there was a lot of discontent with the result. Mistresses complained that servants were incredibly, even outrageously demanding, and that few were prepared to stay long in any one job. Colonial girls were said to be the worst, far too demanding and independent, apparently. Most servants married as soon as they could and set up their own households. And that was hardly surprising because mistresses often expected incredibly long hours from their servants with very little time off. At a time when many male occupations were demanding and getting an eight hour working day, domestic servants were still completely unregulated. Most servants were expected to work at least a 12 hour day with only every other Sunday off, if that. There's a rather remarkable handwritten petition in the Public Record Office collection from, from domestic workers in 1901. They asked in the petition for Parliament to grant a maximum working week of 60 hours for servants with every other Sunday off. Tellingly, they also asked for proper sleeping accommodation to be provided and that to be inspected by, ins by authorities, suggesting that many servants were often expected to bed down in either a kitchen or a laundry with no private personal space at all. And not surprisingly, nothing seems to have come of the petition. But in fact, domestic servants were simply walking away to other work, leaving their erstwhile mistresses to do the lot. There are very few illustrations of servants at work and actually very few photographs or paintings of women performing housework either. Perhaps that's not surprising at a time when photography was expensive and mostly performed in a studio. But there are a few images and here is one. This photograph of a woman in starched cap and apron is labelled simply Bell Richmond. It's dated about 1900 probably reflects the image we all have in our heads of the servant in a wealthy household at this time. But this photograph may actually be more representative. It's titled Madame Strachan. I'm not exactly certain how you pronounce that, her, her name, but Madame Strachan and her three maids, Creswick, around about 1890. The maids hold their tools of trade, a scrubbing brush, potato peeler and boot blacking brush. We don't know who Madame Strachan was, but perhaps she was the proprietor of a boarding house. Increasingly, those who worked as domestic servants did so in hotels and boarding houses rather than in private homes. By 1945, only 18% of women were employed as servants, mostly in hotels, and that was down from 50% 50, 50 in 1900. That left the work to the women of the house, both mother and daughters, once they were old enough to help. It was not until after the Second World War in most households that the white goods we now take for granted began to enter the majority of homes in Victoria. Full post-war employment and relatively high wages, coupled with a local white goods manufacturing industry, meant that these goods, which were often called electric servants, 
became affordable and then essential. And just in time, because married women were literally poised to enter the workforce in significant numbers. Now, just a word about daughters. It's fairly clear that most children in the past were expected to perform small jobs or chores both before and after school. The exception was probably in very wealthy households which had domestic servants. But for many decades, daughters often stayed at home to work alongside their mothers until they married in their turn. Although that also depended on the resources of the family. Many working families needed their children to work outside the home to add their meagre earnings to the household economy. And the same was often true on farms. Although in farming families, women often had farm work to do too, alongside their other household tasks. Dairy farms in particular often depended on women and children to do the milking. And girls probably began this work when they were still quite young, perhaps 10 or so. Little Gladys shown here does look a bit young, admittedly, but so very proud of herself milking the cow. On mixed farms, women and girls often milked the family cow. And many took charge of poultry yards too. Even quite young children could be sent to collect the eggs daily or to feed the hens. In the city, little girls often help their mothers in other ways, running messages, fetching things from the local shop, or delivering parcels of washing or ironing for the mothers who did this for other people. Some either begged or sold small items on the street too, although this was very much frowned upon. Such children were thought to be in moral danger, and probably they were. We know about what happened to some children on the streets. And it's quite clear from court records and police reports that children, especially girls, were at risk in the city in the past, preyed on by unscrupulous men who saw such poor children as fair game. We told the story of two little girls in our Wayward Women exhibition, and you can still find that story online. It's pretty sobering reading, though, I should warn you. A sewing was the other constant task of the busy wife and mother in the past, and little girls were taught to sew from a very early age. Unless they were very wealthy, most of a family's clothing was often made at home, along with much of the household's linen. And until the 1860s, this was entirely sewn by hand. That meant literally hours and hours of sewing. If we consider that a woman's dress in the 1850s and 60s, like the one shown here, often came, contained at least 25 yards of fabric, it's obvious that making such clothing involved thousands and thousands of stitches. In fact, we counted 5,500 stitches in the skirt alone of this 1850s dress. And some of the sewing in this dress is very intricate, requiring a high level of skill. Then there were children's clothes, men's shirts and nightshirts, handkerchiefs, tablecloths, sheets, pillowcases, and so on. And that was before we even begin to think about the piles of mending waiting to be done. A thrifty housewife could extend the life of her family's clothing by judicious altering and mending, darning socks, turning the collars of shirts, letting out, taking in, putting hems up and down, and so on. It's not surprising that few women sat down without what they called their work boxes, meaning their sewing boxes or baskets beside them. A good deal of this work was often done at night by firelight or lamplight and in fact it is probably true that the only time women just sat and did nothing was on a Sunday in church if they got to go. So it comes as no surprise that the invention of the domestic sewing machine was welcomed immediately. It increased the speed of dressmaking hugely and was often the very first item of domestic technology to enter a home. Purchase was made easier by the Singer Company's innovative practice of selling their machines on time payment. Not surprisingly, Singer came to dominate the sewing machine market 
quite quickly. Sewing was also one way in which women could find paid employment. Unfortunately, since so many women could sew, wages are often pitifully low with very long hours, especially in the unregulated labour market of the mid 19th century. But there were always women who needed the work. From the 1860s, these workshops expanded into small factories and began to introduce machines themselves. Haymanson's clothing factory, shown here in the 1860s, was just one of many such workrooms in Melbourne at the time. This illustration of the factory room often also shows the traditional way in which the clothing trade separated men's jobs from women's jobs. Although women could train as tailoresses, as they were called at this time, their training was shorter than the apprenticeship for tailors and didn't cover all aspects of the work. The tasks considered more skilled, like cutting out, hand sewing, pressing and so on, were reserved for men, while women of, often operated the machines and put the pieces together. In this way, the traditional trade guilds protected the privileged place of their male members at the expense of working women. The Tayloresses did create their own union in 1882, the Tayloresses Association of Melbourne, and it won several notable industrial victories. But it was never able to overcome the gender division of tasks or bridge the pay gap. As manufacturing expanded in Victoria, many industries sought out women workers because they were cheaper. It employed children too, often quite young children at first, for the same reason. Industries employing large numbers of women included the clothing trade, as we've seen, woolen mills, food and drink manufacturing, fruit processing, chocolate making, sweets manufacture, and matchmaking. And these industries often clustered in specific areas of the city. For decades, Flinders Lane was associated with the clothing industry, known as the rag trade. And until the 1960s, it was crowded with workrooms, from high-end fashion houses to the makers of cheap, ready-to-wear clothing known as shoddy, which is probably what we're looking at here. Thousands of women and young girls worked in these factories, although most almost always under the supervision of men. Some of these factories were huge concerns like Gibsonia, a complex of textile mills in Collingwood owned by the department store Foy and Gibson. The boot, shoe and clothing trade dominated 19th century Richmond, later joined by match factories, processed foods and heavy engineering in the early 20th century. The giant Bryant and May Matchworks, shown here in Richmond in 1926, employed hundreds of workers in their Richmond factory, including many women who turned out thousands of boxes of their most famous product, redhead matches. Bryant and May claimed that their factories were model workshops with sporting facilities and a cafeteria for workers. One of the largest and most famous factories employing women was McRobertson's chocolate factory in North Fitzroy. From modest beginnings in a home laundry, McRobertson's factory eventually sprawled over 30 acres in the inner city and was known as the Great White City. And McRobertson produced products like uh, Freddo frogs, still made, not by McRobertson's any longer, of course. The factory was known as the Great White City because all of the buildings were painted white and the workers all wore white uniforms too, as you can see here. The factory employed mostly women, but it actually supported the formation of the Female Confectioners Union. McRobertson's also ran what was known as a closed shop, meaning that they employed only union labour. Early factories were unregulated and most demanded long hours from their workers, including children. 12 hour days were common and there was scant regard paid to either safety or providing amenities for workers. If we look at this illustration of the weaving room in one Melbourne factory in 1868, 
we can see how the clothing worn by the women workers would have increased the hazards of working with this unfenced machinery to a huge degree. And sadly, children often suffered a high rate of accident too, especially as they often became tired and uncoordinated towards the end of long days. Concern at the conditions in these factories, especially the working conditions of women and children, finally influenced the Victorian Parliament to try to regulate both hours and conditions. The first of a series of Shops and Factories Acts passed in 1873. This notionally limited the working hours of women and children to eight hours a day, but the Act was amended in the Legislative Council where there were many factory owners sitting, undermining its effectiveness by limiting its application to factories employing more than 10 workers. And since the majority of factories were smaller than this, it left most of them unregulated. It was not until the mid to late 1880s that more effective regulation was introduced and began to have an impact supported by a system of inspection. But despite low wages and poor conditions, many women preferred factory work to working as domestic servants. And this concerned many moralists who worried constantly about unsupervised single women working alongside men. But undoubtedly, the women preferred the relative freedom of the factory away from the constant supervision of a mistress. At the end of a working day, they could go to their own homes and growing numbers of young women preferred to do just that. Manufacturing continued to expand in Victoria in the 20th century, reaching its highest point in the 1950s, when fully 40% of all wage earners worked in secondary industry. The rigid division of secondary industry into men's and women's jobs continued well into the 20th century but it was challenged for the first time by labour shortages during the Second World War. As more and more men were called up to fight, women were asked to take their places, if only on a short-term basis. Both employers and trade unions trenchantly opposed the recruitment of women into men's jobs, even during the war. They were finally persuaded by Prime Minister John Curtin on the assurance that it was only a temporary measure. In what has become a famous statement, Curtin announced in October 1941 uh, that women would be recruited into male industries, but only, as he said, on this condition. All women employed under the conditions approved shall be employed only for the duration of the war and shall be replaced by men as they become available. A separate wages tribunal was created to set the rates of pay for women in these industries. The Women's Employment Board theoretically had the power to make awards at between 60 and 100% of the relevant male rate. But in practice, very few rulings of 100% were ever made. Most were set between 75 and 90%. But that was still a huge in increase for the women in those industries. Unfortunately, the tribunal's power never extended to the wages of those working in traditional women's jobs, which, if anything, stagnated during the war. Some women relished the chance to enter male preserves in heavy industry and munitions, but others were effectively industrial conscripts. From 1943, government had the power to force single women to enter the paid workforce and to direct where they would work. But meanwhile, many worked on in wonder as women proved themselves as able as men to build, do things like building aircraft or work in the dangerous munitions factories. The factories in traditional women's industries, meanwhile, faced great competition from better played work elsewhere. And government was forced into a major propaganda recruitment drive to try to entice workers. But only in the last year or so of hostilities were wages raised, again, temporarily, in those industries too. But at the end of the war, as was always intended, 
these opportunities vanished. As the men returned from the front, the women were summarily replaced and the higher wages vanished with them. The propaganda that had supported women's work during the war swung instead into supporting traditional roles for women as wives and mothers in the post-war world. But nevertheless, increasing numbers of married women began to enter the workforce through the 1950s and 60s. Some of these were post-war migrants who moved into factory work in the many female industries. But women also found work in the new post-war automotive industry and in white good manufacturing. Here, a group of Lebanese workers poses at Ford's Broadmeadows factory in 1988. The post-war period in Victoria was known as the long boom. For the decades of the 1950s and 60s, there was full employment and workers could command good wages and good conditions. Conditions for women in the workforce also improved. In 1950, a minimum wage was set for women workers for the first time. Those campaigning for equal pay were disappointed with the decision, which awarded women 75% of the male rate, but it was a vast improvement on the 50% that had prevailed before. In 1972, the Arbitration Commission also ruled in favour of the principle of equal pay for work of equal value. It was a landmark decision, but of course it still excluded many women working in so-called women's jobs at lower pay. And as you probably know, wage equality, equality remains an elusive goal even now. But sadly, the good years were not to last. The early 1970s saw a toxic combination of local and global factors. Global inflation, rising oil prices, and increased competition from an industrialising Asian market. Well, sounds awfully familiar, doesn't it? Saw Australian industry hit hard. When successive federal governments decided to reduce and then largely remove protective tariffs, industry was unable to compete. 3,000 factories closed their doors in Victoria between 1973 and 1980, throwing many more thousands out of work, and the decline continued. By 2001, a mere 16% of wage earners was employed in manufacturing. By 2016, this had declined further to just 8%. The manufacturing that remains is now in highly specialised areas with small niche markets. Now, many of the workers who lost their jobs found it impossible to find ongoing full-time work, let alone work that was well paid. Instead, part-time casual work proliferated, and we're still dealing with the fallout from that process. Now, I need to backtrack in time a bit now to look at the final area of women's work that I'd like to discuss today, and that is office work. This was the other avenue of employment that opened for women in the last decades of the 19th century, and it would transform women's employment options, especially the options for middle-class women and girls. Once again, though, the office work available was highly gendered. The 19th century office was an entirely masculine space. Men found work as clerks, letter writers, copyists, ledger clerks, and accountants, but none of these jobs was available to women. Several technical inventions of the decades from the 1850s changed that. The first was the telegraph, which expanded in Victoria from the 1950s. While the first telegraphers, people who sent telegraphs, were men, women soon began to see the opportunities presented by working as a telegrapher, encouraged by the unusual willingness of the Victorian post office to employ them. Some women were already employed by the post office as postmistresses before that, but they were a tiny minority and often were the widows of postmasters. 
But the obvious advantage of women to the postal service was the fact that they were paid much less than men, even while performing exactly the same work. While the salaries for women in the post office in 1871 ranged between 60 and 180 pounds per annum, men received salaries of between 80 and 485 pounds, a vast disparity. The post office began to offer training to female telegraph officers called telegraphists in a special women's room at the Central Electric Telegraph Office where the young aspirant studied under the eagle eye of a woman supervisor. Probationers were unpaid for six months, but at the conclusion of the training, they could apply for appointment as assistants in the post office, with the possibility of promotion all the way to postmistress. There was never a shortage of recruits. Other young women flocked to the classes in telegraphy offered from 1872, by a newly opened museum, the Industrial and Technological Museum in Swanston Street and what is where is now um, the State Library. It offered classes for a fee and was swamped with female applicants. As the number of female employees in the postal service grew though, so did public unease. Such women began to be accused of taking men's jobs while the post office was accused of employing women at the expense of men because they were cheaper. Forced onto the defensive, the postmaster general began by restricting the positions that women might occupy, but public debate continued. As the differing colonial postal service moved towards amalgamation into a new federal service after 1901, it seemed at first that the position of women might improve. In response to an equal pay decision in the New South Wales service, female postal employees formed the Victorian Women's Post and Telegraph Officers Association, led by the able spokeswoman Louisa Dunkley. It was largely through their efforts that the principle of equal pay for postmistresses and telegraphists was included in the Commonwealth Public Service Act in 1902. But it was a Pyrrhic victory. After 1900, no new post, post mistresses were appointed and fewer telegraph officers were given permanent appointments. Increasingly, women were recruited to the postal service as telephone switchboard operators, a job classified as women's work at a low rate of pay and with little opportunity for promotion. The short period of opportunity for women that opened in the Victorian Postal Service in the 1870s and 80s closed and was only prized open again in the 1960s and 1970s. <clears throat> but in the meantime, two further inventions of the late 19th century offered alternatives to women. They were the telephone and the typewriter, both inventions of the 1870s. The telephone arrived in Melbourne in the late 1870s, very soon after it was patented in America. At first, all calls had to be connected manually via what was known as a telephone exchange. And from the beginning, these exchanges were staffed by women. They were called telephone switchboard attendants. And because these were classed as women's jobs, the rate of pay was commensurate. The telephone quickly became an essential tool of business and soon there were so many telephones installed in larger business premises that they required their own switchboards to manage the volume of calls in and out. Women generally managed these switchboards too. The other machine to invade the office in the late 19th century was the typewriter. Like the telegraph, typewriters as those who used the machines at first were called, were usually men. But women soon learned to use them too. And once again, business saw the advantage of employing women at half the cost. At first, men and women trained in the use of these office machines side by side, as you can see here. But by the 1920s, women were firmly ensconced behind most typewriters and a new feminized term emerged to describe them, typists. <laughs> 
Both government and business employed typists, often grouped together in typing pools under the watchful eye of a head typist. Some of those women were very experienced, capable workers, but their pay didn't reflect that. All of them were paid less than the most junior clerk, who continued to be a man. In the Commonwealth Public Service, women were actually banned from appointment to the Administrative Third Division until 1947. Married women were banned from any permanent appointment until 1966. Now, the Victorian service never actually banned women from appointment as clerks, but it never appointed any either, except for a brief period during the Second World War, when the shortage of male applicants forced their hand. And all of those women were sacked at the end of the war. Nevertheless, these jobs in the office provided many women with an alternative to working in a factory or serving in a shop. And they were soon one of the most popular occupational choices for young women. Then, as has often happened in the world of work, technology took another turn with the advent of the word processor and then the personal computer. In the 1980s, for the first time, the prospect of a computer on every desk was a real possibility. With devastating speed, the role of the typist became obsolete in its turn. Office workers who'd never learned to type found themselves expected to master these machines, and new terms like multi-skilling and multitasking entered the lexicon of the office. Within a decade, computers took over at the office and increasingly at home, as the processing power of the microchips that power them increased with astonishing speed. By the 1980s, women were also working in general administrative and clerical positions in far greater numbers, as anti-discrimination legislation began to dismantle the many barriers to female employment. But their numbers were not enough to balance the job losses caused by the computer. The replacement by machines of the army of shorthand typists employed in offices throughout the country had a profound effect, not only on the structure of the office, but on the domestic economy of millions of households. And of course, it didn't stop there. The personal computer was followed by email, laptops, mobile phones, video conferencing, and here we are. Arguably, those of us who work in the modern office could not have negotiated COVID without our home computers and all that went with it. But the sad corollary is that many workers who now work in society's so-called unstable gig economy were not so lucky. For them, it was the grim reality of queuing up at Centrelink. Now, this has been a very quick introduction to the history of women's work in Victoria. And of course, I've left an enormous amount out most obviously the slow entry of women into the professions, which happened at different rates from the late 19th century. I've also skated very quickly over the history of women's rights and the increasing moves towards more equality in the workplace after the Second World War, but I'm afraid that will have to wait for another time. So for now, thank you for listening. I'd like to mention that we have two other talks coming up soon too. The first is on the 20th of April at the same time, 11 o'clock, and it will be looking at women's experience in the land army, the women's land army during the Second World War. And then on the 5th of May at 1 p.m., we have a special lunchtime seminar in our material history series. And this one will be rather fun. It's looking at Australian food icons, Vegemite, and the Australian Women's Weekly Birthday Cake Cookbook. So I hope that perhaps some of you might be able to join us at one of those. So thank you very much for listening, and I hope you have a lovely time for the rest of your day. <music>